Extracts from the Major Alphonse Furuma, Open Letter to His Excellency Paul Kogome, also RPF Chairman, and Chairman RPA Command, Kigali, Rwanda, the 23rd of January, 2001. From the time Arusha Peace Agreement was being negotiated up to as late as 1996 you carried out a deliberate policy of using all means possible to reduce the Hutu population in the Umutara, Kibungo, and Dujesara regions. These areas were deliberately resettled by old caseload returnees from Uganda, Tanzania, and Burundi respectively. Families of many top RPF RPA leaders are among those who were resettled in this manner. Certainly, all Rwandese deserve to be settled, but your government could have carried out these resettlements without violating the spirit of the Arusha Peace Agreement and without having to terrorize, displace or kill fellow Rwandese. Having signed the Arusha Peace Agreement, the RPF RPA, supposedly to maintain the Hutu Tutsi power sharing equation, found it convenient to liquidate the only few Hutu fighters who had been previously recruited from the demilitarized zone. You remember, these criminal operations were codenamed Fania. Some of those who survived could give evidence if given certain guarantees. When the RPF RPA launched the offensive to stop genocide, every Hutu was assumed to be a killer. For moths and from one border to another, Hutus were chased and massacred on sight. Where it was not possible to kill, there was no opportunity lost to arrest, torture and detain a Hutu at the slightest provocation. There was thus every raison for every reason for even the moderate Hutus to find it safer to flee the country with the killers. Indeed, some of the bodies, which continued to float in the Akajara River towards the end and shortly after the genocide, included those of Hutus massacred by some RPF RPA elements. Major Alphonse Furuma, open letter to His Excellency Paul Kogome, also RPF Chairman, and Chairman RPA Command, Kigali, Rwanda, the 23rd of January, 2001. Your Excellency. Ref, RPF, RPA performance in the last 10 years. Justification. 20 years ago, the Rwandese Alliance for National Unity, RANU, was formed. It is about 13 years ago since we transformed RANU into the Rwandese Patriotic Front and the Rwandese Patriotic Army, RPF, RPA. It is about 10 years ago since we launched the armed struggle against the dictatorship of Juvenal Habilimana, and about 6 years since the RPF RPA government was sworn in, while for 4 years now, Rwanda has military intervened in the Democratic Republic of Congo. After all these years of work members of RPF RPA needed to have sat together like it used to be, to share achievements, appreciate failures, share experiences, and chart out the way forward. Unfortunately, such opportunities no longer exist, if they do you only share them with around you, whose preoccupation is to tell you what they know you would like to hear. However, we must here in mind the fact that there are millions of Rwandese who are not members of the RPF RPA and who out of no noise of theirs have been subject to RPF RPA policies for the last 6 to 10 years. There are also our neighboring countries, which haven't continued to feel the direct impact of that happiness on our soils, day by day. This is not to mention the Democratic Republic of the Congo in which our forces have been operational for several years. There is also the international community, which for obvious reasons we cannot afford to ignore. To all these, to all of us and for all the years, the RPF RPA leadership must be accountable. Background I am sure you will remember that post-independent Rwanda had a problem of successive undemocratic regimes, which among other things had deliberately denied sections of the population fundamental rights. You will also recall, that when, we conceived and launched the RPF RPA way back in 1987, we had the task to build a mass-based political movement and a pro-people national army. The RPF RPA a political program, constitution, and code of conduct are all clear testimonies to our vision of the struggle we wanted to wage and the kind of society we wanted to build. We all know that it was in this spirit that the RPF RPA continued to work up to 1990, whether in recruitment of cadres, recruitment of soldiers, in mass mobilization, in fundraising or any other activity. Indeed, I am reliably informed that in the same spirit that the RPF in the region and abroad continued to work up to July 1994 when the RPF RPA led government was sworn in. However, allow me to state very categorically that with the onset of the armed struggle in northern Rwanda, 
the strategy of forging a genuine broad-based movement, the building of a pro-people army, mass empowerment and popular participation all become things of the past. On the contrary, as the years pass by, militarism, terrorism, killings, elimination of political opponents, systematic looting and economic plunder, finally assume dominance over what should have been our pro-people political ideology and pro-people military doctrine. After the capture of state power, the negative tendencies and practices become generalized, institutionalized and regionalized. There is also the personality cult that has been created around you. In typical Rwandese ancient fashion culture, you have why omission or commission allowed yourself to be taken and all-knowing and infallible. This mystification combined with your terrorist methods has reduced some of our people to silence and passivity rather than staying up to meet their daily challenges, rather than raising up to challenge some of your excesses, they simply sit out the days waiting for someone to miraculously come to their rescue. Some even naively believe that without you and your regime, their lives would come to a sudden and tragic end. The situation therefore demands that you personality, and your regime, become publicly demystified as part and parcel of the process of empowerment of our people. The purpose of this letter is to highlight the fundamental weakness and failures of the RPF RPA leadership over the last 10 years. Early years. It has over the years surgically been observed that the RPF RPA current leadership only pays lip service to the RPF RPA political program and the programs of the respective governments of national unity. It indeed appears that the RPF RPA leaders shared with the rest of the members only one of the several points of the RPF RPA political program the point concerning statelessness but as the events continue to prove, even this seems to have been purely from as the events continue to prove, even this seems to have been purely from a selfish point of view. It has in fact been established beyond any reasonable doubt, that your leadership has no fundamental differences with previous dictatorial regimes, and that the differences if any, are only quantitative. By the fall of Kigali, only a handful of Hutu leader were members of the RPF RPA. Evidence bears witness to the fact that the opportunities were deliberately limited, the pretext being that every Hutu could be an enemy. This parochial approach created mobilization and recruitment difficulties from as way back as 1997. To date the Hutu who are members of the RPF RPA can still be counted off on one's fingertips. The new Hutus, who braved it into the RPF RPA and survived execution, remained untrusted and marginalized. The long-time RPF chairman, Honorable Colonel Alex Kanyarengwe was similarly treated. He was throughout all his years as the chairman of RPF to know no secrets, leave alone having any access to operational information, his rich political and military experience in Rwandese affairs notwithstanding. While he was in the know of the things which were going on, he was wise enough to only keep a silent opposition, thanks to which it was never found necessary to eliminate him. However, in typical RPF RPA reshuffle style, he was eventually striped off his ministerial post and RPF chairmanship. In essence his chairmanship had been ceremonial and shrewdly intended to give the RPF RPA a who to face. When we freed political detainees from Ruhinjiri prison in the initial years of the struggle you treated Hutus with suspicion and did not assign the appropriate duties. This was particularly true in the case of the senior army officers, who could not trust with command responsibilities, their superior military training and experience notwithstanding. One of the Hutu senior officers, who had in fact become an RPA member of high command, the dynamic command Muvunanyambo, who had provided so popular within the RPF RPA rank and file, was mysteriously murdered by armed people suspected to the high command. Some officers later quietly confirmed he had been eliminated. Another Hutu officer who had much earlier defected from the then Rwandese armed forces and whose had played a crucial role in interception of government military radio communication was similarly executed. There are RPA officers who could testify to these cases if assured of their security. In the RPF RPA operational areas, the silent but official policy was elimination and or displacement of Hutus. There was no serious effort to mobilize the population and popularize the struggle. Neither was there any serious effort to recruit and develop combatants and political workers from the local population. This is exactly why the so-called RPF liberated zones literally zones literally had no people. The new people, 
who appeared in the camps in the political program, constitution, and code of conduct are all clear testimonies to our vision of the struggle we wanted to wage and the kind of society we wanted to build. We all know that it was in this spirit that the RPF-RPA continued to work up to 1990, whether in recruitment of carders, recruitment of soldiers, in mass mobilization, in fundraising or in any other activity. Indeed, I am reliably informed that it was in the very same spirit that the RPF-RPA continued to work up to July 1994 when the RPF-EPA-led government was sworn in. However, allow me to start very categorically that with the onset of the armed struggle in the northern Rwanda, the strategy of forging a genuine broad movement, the building of a pro-people army, mass empowerment and popular participation all become things of the past. On the contrary, as the years passed by, militarism, killings, elimination of political opponents, systematic looting and economic plunder, finally assumed dominance over what should have been our pro-people political ideology and pro-people military doctrine. After the capture of state power, these negative tendencies and practices become generalized, institutionalized and regionalized. There is also the personality cult that has been created around you. In typical Rwandese ancient fashion culture, you have by omission or commission allowed yourself to be taken as all-knowing and infallible. This mystification combined with your terrorist methods has reduced some of our people to silence and passivity rather than standing up to meet their daily challenges, rather than rising up to challenge some of your excess, they simply sit out the days waiting for someone to miraculously come to their rescue. Some even naively believe that without you and your regime, their lives would come to a sudden and tragic end. On your part, you have exploited this weakness of our people by turning yourself into a de facto dictator in all matters of national life. You have become the executive, the legislature and the judiciary, you have become the complainant, the prosecutor and the judge. The situation therefore demands that your personality and your regime become publicly demystified as and part and parcel of the process of empowerment of our people. The purpose of this letter is to highlight the fundamental weakness and failures of the RPF-RPA leadership over the last 10 years. Early years It has over the years tragically been observed that the RPF-RPA current leadership only pays lip service to the RPF-RPA political program and the programs of the respective governments of national unity. It indeed appears that the RPF-RPA leaders shared with the members only one of the several points of the RPF-RPA political program the point concerning statelessness but as the events continue to prove, even this seems to have been purely from a selfish point of view. It has in fact been established beyond any reasonable doubt that your leadership has no fundamental differences with previous directorial regimes and that the differences if any, only quantitative. By the fall of Kigali, only a handful of Hutu leaders were members of the RPF RPA. Evidence bears witness to the fact that the opportunities were deliberately limited, the pretext being that every Hutu could be an enemy. This parochial approach created mobilization and recruitment difficulties from as way back as 1997. To date the Hutu who are members of the RPF RPA can still be counted off one one's fingertips. The few Hutus, who braved it into the RPF RPA and survived execution, remained untrusted and marginalized. The longtime RPF chairman, Honorable Colonel Alex Kanyarengwe, was similarly treated. He was throughout all his years as the chairman of RPF to know no secrets, leave alone having any access to operational information, his rich political and military experience in Rwandese affairs notwithstanding. While he was in the know of some of the things which were going on, he was wise enough to only keep a silent opposition, thanks to which it was never found necessary to eliminate him. However, in typical RPF RPA reshuffle style, he was eventually striped off his ministerial post and RPF chairmanship. In essence, his chairmanship had been ceremonial and shrewdly intended to give the RPF RPA a who to face. When we freed political detainees from Ruhinjiri prison in the initial years of the struggle, you treated Hutus with suspicion and did not assign them appropriate duties. This was particularly true in the case of the senior army officers, who could not be trusted with command responsibilities, their superior military training and experience notwithstanding. One of the Hutu senior officers, who had in fact become an RPA member of high command, the dynamic command Muvunanyambo, who had proved so popular within the RPF RPA rank and file, was mysteriously murdered by armed people suspected to have been escorts from the high command. 
Some officers later quietly confirmed he had been eliminated. Another Hutu officer who had much earlier defected from the then Rwandese armed forces and who had played a crucial role in interception of government military radio communication was similarly executed. There are RPA officers who could testify to these cases if assured of their security. In the RPF BARPA operational areas, the silent but official policy was elimination and or displacement of Hutus. There was no serious effort to mobilize the population and popularize the struggle. Neither was there any serious effort to recruit and develop combatants and political workers from the local population. This is exactly why the so-called RPF literally had no people. The few people who appeared in the camps in the RPF RPA rear were survivors of such a naive political military policy. Prisoners of war were routinely tortured and executed. Even those who were kept alive for journalists to see were all finally executed. The only exception being a handful of prisoners of war who were deliberately kept and exchanged with RPA soldiers in the Arusha Peace Agreement framework. This is the very reason why by July 1994, there was no single RPA prisoner of war alive. The RPA continues to kill tortured prisoners of war up today. The International Committee of the Red Cross AICRC witnessed cases in June 2000 in the DRC. All along in the armed struggle, military intelligence, which was your personal creation, and which directly reported to you, tortured and killed civilian suspects. Military intelligence bases everywhere were associated with graves for such victims. Some of these graves like the ones at Commune Kinyumi HQs had to be exhumed after government fears that human rights groups had been tipped off about them. Late Honorable Burakari Everest, a progressive politician from Commune Rutta and a member of parliament for the Liberal Party, was murdered in cold blood by one of your soldiers so to destroy evidence concerning many civilians from the communes of Bayamba who were arrested, interrogated, tortured, killed and buried in a mass grave at that commune headquarters. When his killer pretended to escape and a mock arrest and trial were stage managed, the killer was sentenced to a few months imprisonment. When this appeared so ridiculous you personally ordered for a retrial, which only added a few more months to his sentence. I shall not be surprised if more witnesses of the Kinyumi massacres disappeared. From the time a Rucha peace agreement was being negotiated up to as late as 1996, you carried out a deliberate policy of using all means possible to reduce the Hutu population in the Umutara, Kibungo and Bugesera regions. These areas were deliberately resettled by old caseload returnees from Uganda, Tanzania and Burundi respectively. Families of many top RPF RPA leaders are among those who were resettled in this manner. Certainly, all Rwandese deserve to be settled, but your government could have carried out these resettlements without violating the spirit of the Arusha Peace Agreement and without having to terrorize, displace or kill fellow Rwandese. Having signed the Arusha Peace Agreement, the RPF RPA, supposedly to maintain the Hutu Tutsi power sharing equation, found it convenient to liquidate the only few Hutu fighters who had been previously recruited from the demilitarized zone. You remember, these criminal operations were codenamed Fania. Some of those who survived could give evidence if given certain guarantees. When the RPF RPA launched the offensive to stop genocide, every Hutu was assumed to be a killer. For moths and from one border to another, Hutus were chased and massacred on sight. Where it was not possible to kill, there was no opportunity lost to arrest, torture and detain a Hutu at the slightest provocation. There was thus every raison for every reason for even the moderate Hutus to find it safer to flee the country with the killers. Indeed some of the bodies, which continued to float in the Akajara River towards the end and shortly after the genocide, included those of Hutus massacred by some RPF RPA elements. Some RPF RPA members originating from various parts of Rwanda are known to have made revenge killing in their respective home areas. Similarly, some RPF administrators are known to have used security agents to eliminate prominent Hutus in their respective areas of control. Some of these killings, which were carried out in broad daylight and witnessed by relatives and neighbors of victims were reported to you and yet most of those responsible for these crimes still hold senior government posts and some have since been promoted. As the war resumed during the genocide, you ordered the RPA field engineers to launch a campaign to destroy by mining all premises, residential, commercial or industrial, identified as belonging to Hutus. The towns of Kibungo, 
Kigali City and Gitarama serve as very good examples. The first RPF government was confronted with not only a country without a population, but also a country totally looted and ransacked by the RPF RPA. By the end of the war, in what was called secured property operations, the RPF RPA had systematically looted or destroyed all movable household, private or public properties countrywide. Likely enough the RPF RPA leaders who were under instructions to execute the plunder are still with you today and also holding very responsible offices. They too could tell us why they did so, under whose instructions and where they put the loot. In towns and urban centers, returned including RPF RPA senior members, without any restraint or order took over residential, commercial and industrial premises of those who had fled. In rural areas, returnees similarly took over homes, lands, banana and coffee plantations as well as cattle belonging to those who had fled. The struggle to recover these properties by the rightful owners rages on up this day. In the meantime, in the high echelons of the RPF RPA leadership, scrambles for political offices had heightened ethnic as well as anglophone tensions. These conflicts continue to date and have in fact been compounded by inter-party rivalries, personal ambitions and intrigue, to extent that in high offices heads roll regularly. While it may be appreciated that the RPA had operational difficulties in the first phase of the armed struggle, it must also be said that it has always had very little concern for preservation of own forces. This is how we lost an unknown number of comrades in very many poorly planned operations. This is how we lost too many due comrades due to preventable and or controllable diseases like dysentery at a time we did not exactly lack medical personnel and medical supplies. Similarly, this is how we lost many comrades due to a combination of hunger and cold when we could have better utilized available food and clothing. Yet during the entire struggle, the families of these late comrades, in addition to having sent their children to the front line, also regularly sent you funds to buy their children's arms and ammos, to feed them, to dress them and to purchase medicines to treat the sick and wounded. All in all your leadership tended to handle human lives as if they were factory products, which could be replenished indefinitely. Unfortunately this inhuman way of managing human beings continues to date in the DRC. You should be kind enough and show the families of these late comrades where the remains of their children lie. You should also account for the funds they sent to you over the years. After April 1994. You will remember the crisis your government was confronted with concerning management of the hundreds of suspected genocide perpetrators. In the public, in parliament and in the executive people held extreme positions some calling for mass sentencing of detained genocide suspects, while others felt there was need for individual trials, categorization of the suspects of genocide and use of traditional community courts. The rest of the RPF RPA leadership did not come out clearly to signal the way forward out of this crisis. It was only the wise leadership and initiative of this His Excellency President Bizimangu that saved the day through the Uruguiro village Saturday meetings. During the counter-insurgency operation some of your commanders did not only deliberately use excessive force to victimize innocent civilians caught up in the armed conflict, but they in fact, on occasions to kill the populations for example in revenge for an attack on soldier or a group of soldiers. The case of Commune Kanama is well known to those familiar with Rwanda. Similarly, there is an unknown number of displaced people who were blown up by your bombs and mines while hiding in the cases of Ruhinjiri or Jisini. The remains of these victims to date have been recovered by relatives for appropriate burial. That these people had been made captives by the rebels should not have been the pretext to use such a force and means as was used, resulting into massive deaths of non-military personnel. The deliberate military attack on Kibeho, as known refugee camp with thousands of people, resulting into heavy loss of civilians' life including women, children and the aged could have been avoided too. The sorting out of armed elements from the camp could have been better resolved through negotiations with the relevant UN agencies and NGOs in charge of the camp. You will no doubt obviously remember that in all such cases, it was only when human rights groups, observers, monitors, stepped in to investigate that you personally ordered for ceremonial arrests and mock trials. On your express orders such officers were normally redeployed immediately the dust settled down. These cases are just too many. 
From 1995, the RPF-RPA government has imposed upon Rwandese an illegal, ill-conceived and unsustainable program of villagization, which involves taking over of land previously owned by some families, which is then shared out with other families without even due consideration for property and crops lost. This program could have been better planned and executed to avoid creation of unnecessary ethnic tensions. You and some of your senior government officials including police and army officers have illegally acquired large stretches of land for modern dairy farming by displacing innocent peasants using force, intimidation, money or any other means. Some of the very many cases of complaints by peasants have been brought to you personally. RPF governments it must be said have been characterized by total anarchy as greedy ministers quickly try to get as much loot as possible, as if the government is not there to stay, or as if the ministries are only under their control for a few days. Some ministers are on record for having deposited ministerial funds on personal accounts. In record time, some of these ministers and their business allies are busy buying and their business allies are busy buying and raising mansions in Kigali City and abroad. Those among them who have been close to you have been shielded from being queried by the parliament as you have always managed to have them transferred to other ministries, while others are given ambassadorial posts or assigned other national responsibilities. The RPF BARPA has so degenerated that it has no room for auto-evaluation. The government of Prime Minister Twagira Mungu was dissolved because of these issues. Several Hutu ministers including those of justice had to resign for similar reasons. Former RPF ministers and especially Seth Sendashonga could not compromise their positions. Consequently, he was forced to resign, fled to Nairobi, where he was assassinated to destroy evidence concerning deliberate Hutu killings. The parliament also got divided over the issues and finally Honorable Colonel Lizindi Theonest resigned his RPF parliamentary seat, fled to Nairobi via Kinshasa, where he was similarly assassinated to destroy evidence. He had been the administrator of Biamba Prefecture from the time of its capture and had documented RPF, RPA human rights violations countrywide. How Jean Baptiste Mbera Bahizi of the Rwandese Socialist Party resigned his seat in protest over the excesses of the first RPF, RPA government and went for further studies in France. It is often alleged that some of these Hutu politicians associated with the old regimes have criminal records. The RPF, RPA government should have had them tried and convinced, or cleared of such crime allegations. Silence or exile. Instead of transforming the objective condition into subjective conditions through mass mobilizing, the RPF, RPA has instead resorted to intimidation and has enforced upon the population a silence worse than that imposed by previous regimes. While everybody sees and many understand what is happening, nobody dares to talk political parties, newspapers, radios, human rights groups and even churches. If you are a Hutu and you dare criticize the government, you are treated as a genocide perpetrator. If you are a Tutsi and you talk your mind, you are treated as a negative element and sidelined, while if you are a soldier and you make any criticism you are charged with subversion and treason. The RPF, RPA has stifled all other political forces, the legislature, the judiciary, individual members of the executive, as well as the media and human rights organizations countrywide. The new private newspapers operating in Rwanda have also been crippled by the terror of the RPF, RPA government and none can dare raise any criticism of your office or your government. You will remember John the chief editor and owner of the news line was detained for months for merely having published a story of the helicopter deal. Ignatius Mugabo a columnist with the same newspapers had to flee the country in connection with same story. Jean-Pierre Mugabe a long-time RPF cadre fled to America in similar circumstances for his bold publications in the La Liberite newspaper about your dictatorial regime. Newsline columnist Kanuma has been similarly harassed for his been similarly harassed for his publications. You have deliberately restricted the establishment of independent radios and televisions yet you boast of having opened up the doors for liberalization. Finally Rwandese have no choice, they have been narrowed down to the national television and RPF, RPA newspapers, which only reproduce whatever you have fed them on. You have ensured enforcement of this silence thanks to the deployment of the coercive instruments of the state. Military intelligence detention centers are normally full of military and civilian suspects, Republican Guard killer squads have become the nightmare of those who do not exactly speak your language, 
while similar external intelligence personnel roam regional capitals in search of political dissidents. Parties have in turn become victims of these killers, and Rwandis have become familiar with frequent mysterious deaths. Given no option many Rwandis, some of whom have invested all their lives in the struggle for positive change find themselves fleeing their homeland like they have done before. Ministers, members of parliament, army and police officers, journalists, business people, students in higher institutions of learning and ordinary civil servants are leaving the country one by one. Brutalized students flee. Students in institutions of higher education, continue to be victims of an all-conceived and poorly implanted bilingual program. While the idea of making the institutions bilingual is excellent, there was need to streamline modalities of how the program could have been successfully implemented. Whether we like it or not, it is relatively easier, at least in Rwanda today, to change from French use to use of English. In any case it is not possible under Rwandese conditions to study a language a language like French for a period of less than one year, and you sit for university examinations with classmates who have studied the same language for many years and vice versa. Unfortunately, some of those around you did not have the guts to tell that the program needed some middle modifications to make it more appropriate to all beneficiaries. The university rector and vice rector for academic affairs can bear witness to this, they even appreciated the fact that the anglophone students would indeed have difficulties as compared to their counterparts in the francophone section. You did not take the trouble to have an objective view of the situation. As often happens, you harried to believe that the young boys and girls had become confused and misguided by opportunistic elements. However, even if this was true, the solution should not have been to unleash the military police, military intelligence and the gendarmerie to harass and brutalize the students when they made a peacefully demonstration. Ironically, some of these students with relatives close to you in government were advised to flee the country while others were provided with overseas scholarships. When the students got frightened and fled and you failed to have them back you took it personally and you make regular and ferocious attacks, calling them opportunists and alluding to their being manipulated by enemies inside and outside the country. You have made these children homeless. Many more students in our institutions continue to be victims of this rigid educational approach. RPF RPA constituency. The RPF RPA used to be a mass based and pro people movement, receiving inputs of ideas and resources from the population, and in turn, it remained accountable to the people. It was an organization that greatly depended on the work of large number of politicized, disciplined and dedicated cadres deployed in Rwanda, in the region and abroad. These cadres are the ones who carried out the many tasks to support the RPF RPA war effort. Over the years, the cadres by virtue of their work and relationship with the various leader under who they served, developed substantial influence and powers especially of even senior leaders. When the RPF RPA government was sworn in, there was a big international debate as to whether all cadres should be integrated in government or whether some senior cadres should remain in RPF secretariat, monitoring and reinforcing government performance. The later idea was defeated and the institution of cadreship was indirectly dissolved and attempts were made to integrate cadres into various government organs. I clearly remember the proceedings of RPF RPA meetings in Kanom officers' mess, all members of the government executive, you inclusive, ganged up against the possibility of a strong RPF secretariat. Why the fear? Anyway, some of us cited there then, and watching the subsequent circus of job lobbying, quietly concluded that the RPF RPA had in fact not taken over the government, but rather that the government had taken over the RPF RPA. However, since most cadres did not boast of necessarily very high academic qualifications, they were substituted in leadership positions by professional bureaucrats who unfortunately ended up as mere rubber stamps for their bosses in the prospective services. This created a wide gap between the RPF RPA leadership in Kigali and the RPF RPA support up country. This gap has never been covered to date. Indeed, the RPF RPA leadership has finally been completely taken over by the government, what remains is the RPF secretariat, Dr. Charles Muley Gondé's office, an office whose sole purpose of existence is to enforce on other political forces in the government the whims and wishes of the RPF RPA leadership. You misconceive a feeling that all Tutsis by inclination belong to your RPF RPA and that while Hutus may not be transformed and trusted fully, some are all the same needed to give the RPF RPA government a Hutu face. 
you have deliberately restricted the establishment of independent radios and televisions yet you boast of having opened up the doors for liberalization. Finally Rwandese have no choice, they have been narrowed down to the national television and RPF RPA newspapers, which only reproduce whatever you have fed them on. I do not have to mention names, but you very well know how many Hutu ministers, senior civil servants, prefecture and commune administrators have supposedly been recruited into the RPF RPA under this bizarre program. These incidentally are the ones supposed to lead your RPF RPA to victory, come the parliamentary and presidential elections in the year 2003. But as many previously recruited Hutus are now leaving the RPF RPA. What a strategy! You should come to terms with the reality that the RPF RPA you lead has no support anywhere in Rwanda, not even among the old caseload returnees in Umutara, Kibungo, Bugyesara regions and elsewhere. These have most frustrated by the fact that while they offered their children and financial resources to the RPF RPA during all these years of fighting, they remain poverty-stricken and without even the bare minimum of services and infrastructure. Many are busy fleeing to Uganda and Tanzania in the search for a better life. The case of cattle keepers fleeing back to Uganda from drought and disease in the Umutara, Kibungo, Bugyesara regions are a case in point. But what have you done for the rest of the Rwandese peasants in the hills? Production levels are declining as farmers have lost morale and have restored to trying to produce just enough for themselves. In other areas relative and absolute hunger continues to take lives season after season. No wonder many peasants are now fleeing from this rampant seasonal hunger to Uganda. In towns, hunger is biting too, and yet your government blocks cheap milk, fish and other foodstuffs from neighboring Uganda, in a distinguished effort to protect the market for your personal diary farms and milk plants. Trade commerce and industry are on the decline too, due to a combination of high taxation, high cost of imports and declining consumption. The Majowa warehouses are empty and so are the shops. RPF RPA historical treated as disposable commodity. Your leadership has not only betrayed the traditional RPF RPA constituency, but it has in fact treated the historical leaders of the RPF RPA as responsible commodities where are those patriotic individuals who initially conceived the necessity to launch a progressive organization to struggle for the restoration of rights of all Rwandese. Where are the initial Ranu members who kept Ranu going in Uganda, in Kenya and Burundi in those very difficult years, when even fellow Rwandese refugees thought of resistance to Habarimana as sheer madness? You should know that it was Ranu which mobilized and facilitated the mass influx of its cadres and members from Kenya, Uganda and Burundi to join the NRM NRA in the early 1980s. You know that by 1986, Ranu was not only the only viable Rwandese political organization opposed to the Habilimana regime, but it also boasted of many officers and men in the rank and file of the NRA. You will recall that it was essentially these cadres, officers, and men who in fact initiated and ensured the transition from Ranu to RPF RPA, and that it was the same cadres, officers, and men who carried out recruitment and political training of the initial RPF cadres. Don't you remember that it is these former members of Ranu who sustained RPF RPA activities in the region and abroad up 1994? What right do you have therefore to deny the RPF RPA of its historical membership and to treat the founding members of our struggle as responsible commodity? Similar treatment is extended to the surviving founder members of the RPA. Without mentioning names you very well know how you have gradually marginalized these senior commanders including those who were members of the RPF RPA High Command. It is certainly not honorable to chase out into the cold our one-time top commanders, their historical limitations notwithstanding. Have you ever thought they could be honorable retirement? What do you think goes on in the minds of serving officers when they see their seniors treated like disposable commodities? I do not have to mention that it is a shame that the orphans, windows, and parents of late comrades, particularly those who served in senior positions should continue to languish in abject poverty while you and your government officials continue to live in the luxury our poor nation can least afford. It is as if the historical mission of all these comrades was to propel you and those around you to state power. Years, when even fellow Rwandese refugees thought of resistance to Habarimana as sheer madness. Survivors of Genocide Programs to support the victims of genocide whether in terms of shelter, education, medical care, economic, 
physical, and or psychological rehabilitation remain a shame. Widows, orphan and the handicapped, remain isolated and neglected. The highly talked about fund for genocide survivors has lost construction funds to companies owned by some top government officials. The funds for education have been diverted to educate relatives of top government officials while needy survivors all over the country are not even able to reach its offices and present their cases. This is one reason why the RPF RPA is most UN popular with survivors of genocide. It is for the same reason that survivors of genocide have lost hope and have despaired whenever there is any opportunity they flee Rwanda to seek political asylum especially in Europe and America. A more genuine reason however is the fact that as survivors they are not ready to be caught up again in another round of genocide or a similar tragedy. Contradictions in the National Police The National Police of Rwanda was formed out of pressure of the funders of Rwanda. Whereas it is the agenda of RPF RPA to militarize as much as it can, the idea of the funders was to help build a democratic government characterized by the rule of law, which among others is ensured by a professional police. You hesitantly accepted to dissolve the former paramilitary gendarmerie and integrated it with the communal, urbane police and the civilian judicial police, IPJ, not at will. As a result your national police mentors, under your instructions, have sought recourse in building a disguised paramilitary national police, not very different from the disbanded gendarmerie. There has not been any effort to encourage professional needed in all sectors of a new police like ours. On the contrary, 15 military cadet officers who recently graduated from Rwanda Military Academy were quickly integrated in national police and assigned leadership roles, yet the military science skills acquired from their training do not in any way provide any better police skills than those possessed by those they lead. Former officers from the communal police have been marginalized yet they possess better skills acquired from the police cadet training schools they underwent in Uganda and Zimbabwe. They are considered by former gendarmerie and other officers from their army as inferior and have as such been allocated inferior responsibilities in the police services. The police force continues to operate without crucial legal instruments like the Police Act and the Police Code of Conduct. It goes without saying therefore, that injustices are eminent in handling police complaints and act of undisciplined and insubordination. The cause for delaying these legal instruments is none other than the reason why the army doesn't have them either. You are busy trying to concretize your agenda of building a paramilitary police in RPA style, where the terms and conditions of service are not streamlined and the members of the force are kept in a bondage of silence and fear to query the running of the institution and are detained and reist without fair hearing. It is reliably alleged that you personally objected to the more realistic salaries proposed by the National Assembly, which would have gone a long way in safeguarding the police service from your logic is ironically characterized by the Bush hangover of sacrifice by the common man, while your leadership is on the rampage plundering the county's scarce resources for self-enrichment. So, no wonder hundreds of former gendarmerie have refused to join your paramilitary police, I mean the one still detained at Gabiro Training Wing. No wonder also that some of the new police officers and men are already fleeing from the same paramilitary police. Partisan Security Institutions While I personally believe in politicized security institutions like the police, the army and other security organs, and while I believe that such institutions could make positive political contribution s in parliament or elsewhere, I certainly condemn security organs, which abandon their national responsibilities and become royal to individuals and cliques. This is one of your greatest failures in the last 10 years, the total failure to transform the RPF, RPA government security organs into patriotic and national security institutions defending the rights of all citizens. Clearly the RPA, the police and all intelligence agencies have all been basically built from a Tutsi population. It was also early explained how elements from the RPA were ordered to deliberately kill innocent civilians or to commit revenge killings or use excessive force against sections of our population. I must tell you in the strongest possible terms, that you have hijacked the RPF, RPA security institutions and turned them into instruments serving you and those around you. You have given these institutions the false belief that they stand for RPF, RPA at Tutsi interests, as opposed to the interests of the nation. The RPF, RPA representatives to the parliament serve the purpose of only spying on fellow parliamentarians for you, but also lobbying according to your instructions. Whenever necessary you use these army representatives to intimidate fellow parliamentarians into supporting this or idea.
you have even as often as you have found necessary involved the RPA field commanders in administrative matters to protect your narrow interests. It is a shame that in the entire country today, the RPF, RPA security institutions like the army, police and intelligence organs are being used to intervene in preparations for the coming elections by openly manipulating and or intimidating the population into voting for candidates favored by the RPF, RPA leadership in Kigali. In essence, these organs have been sent to unleash terror on the population and non-RPF candidates. Sham institutions Just like in the case of the national police, the government have correctly insisted that your government must show serious commitment to good governance, democratization, human rights and rule of law, transparency in the use of national finances, justice, national unity and national reconciliation and like. You have responded by setting up the Auditor General's office the Human Rights Commission, the National Reconciliation Commission, the Electoral Commission, the National Police, they appointed an Inspector General of Government and shamelessly placed him in your office. I wonder whether your financiers are impressed. Rwandese are not. Just like you have reduced the Transitional National Assembly and the Judiciary to a state as subservient to your executive, we know and it is clear that right from the word go, these institutions can never deliver because they have been set up and structured, financed and staffed to ensure that they have no independence and powers of their own and are to remain subservient to your executive and therefore to you in person. However, maybe you have a point in as far these institutions will shield you from the international community and give you the license to do what you wish to do at home, while using them to silence any voices of dissent. For example, we have for years now lived with the toothless auditor generals, the Human Rights Commission and the National Reconciliation Commission, they have all not gone beyond so-called national seminars and shallow media propaganda to give the impression they are operational. In this way indeed, these institutions rather than promoting good governance, serve you by covering up the mismanagement of state affairs by your team. While the RPF RPA intervention in the DRC was justified, we know that our noble mission in the DRC has been and continues to be sacrificed at the expense of individual interests, leave alone associated military blunders which have cost so many dear lives. The RPA approach, it must be stated, has been purely militaristic and opportunistic. Despite several years of support, the RCD Goma forces remain small in number, poorly supplied and trained, poorly equipped, commanded and undisciplined. Political work in the RPF RPA Goma controlled areas has never taken off. The soldiers and politicians only have casual contacts with the population at airports, by the roadside or on mines. Because Kabila has continued to infiltrate better equipped and more organized rebels in the RPA rear, thereby threatening to bring the war arena back to Rwanda, it has just downed on you that you have no capacity to sustain fighting along so many fronts. Is it not rather late that you have just dispatched training teams with the objective of raising 60,000 Congolese soldiers? RPA attack on the UPDF in Kinsangani. Why did you hurriedly resort to the use of military means against a long-standing ally like Uganda, to resolve what after all did not even amount to tactical political differences, which in any case were still under discussion? You certainly owe an apology to the people of Uganda and the DRC for having started the fighting in Kisangani. I know most Rwandese including many RPF, RPA officers and men do not know this, but some of us had the opportunity to have been on the ground in Kisangani. Given the historical links between the peoples of Uganda and the peoples of Rwanda, was it not most treacherous on your part that on more than one occasion, you deliberately allowed your forces in Kisangani to violate the Mwaya Lodge ceasefire agreement on which you had just put your signature? It was most tragic that throughout the fighting in Kisangani 3, and despite so many appeals from the monarch, the RPA under your orders, refused a ceasefire so as to allow, deployment of JCC th monarch ceasefire monitors as well teams to facilitate humanitarians work. Why have you up to now not taken responsibility for your due share of the mistakes in Kisangani? Why do you continue to deceive the RPA, the Rwandese and the world about what actually happened in Kisangani and on the causes of failure to reconcile your differences with the government of Uganda? Appropriation of DRC Wealth What mineral wealth and cash was secured from Congo? How much was kept by individuals and how much was handed over for army use? What is sure is that commanders in that operation had enough of their share of the spoils of war in Congo. 
you do not have to ask any body, they are a distinct class of their own distinguished among other things by the number of houses they have purchased in Kigali and abroad, thriving business enterprises and healthy bank accounts some of them in US dollars. They have good reasons for being the hardcore supporters of your regime. How much money is contributed monthly and directly to the RPF RPA by foreign companies operating in the DRC? How much money is raised from all the mining and trading operations carried out directly by the RPA in the DRC like Coltan Mining at Punya and other locations? How much money is raised by the Congo Desk Department of External Intelligence from its monopoly handling of minerals and other commodities in the RPA, RC Digoma Control Territory? Maybe you could also shed light on how much wealth has been accumulated by the RPF RPA commodity companies. I know that they operate indirectly using the strategy of forming partnerships with reliable and financially strong business people, who in most cases provide the capital and expertise while the RPF only provides protection and profits eventually getting equally shared out. How much direct cash payments does the RPF GOMA monthly remit to the RPF RPA, whether for purchases or for any other purpose? Liaoming security crisis in the Kivu provinces. The world must know that despite Rwanda's security concerns the RPF, RPA conduct of the war in the DRC and particularly in North and South Kivu, has given rise to the formation of more Congolese militias some of them with improved military skills and military supplies. One such a group in South Kivu is led by intellectuals who regularly articulate their cause one mobile radio station, as being liberation of the two Kivas from Rwandese occupation. You know that the Kinshasa government supplies some of these groups in the Kivas by airdrops. They have substantial arms and ammos, modern communication equipment including satellite telephones and they are not lacking in manpower and minerals. You very well remember that from operational reports of late last year, Rwandese armed groups in North Kivu made several successful attacks on the RPA. Since the RPA went to the DRC, these groups have not finally become smaller, fewer, or even necessarily less effective. While they are not fighting just across the border. All this means that Rwanda's presence in the DRC is not exactly resolving Rwanda's security concerns. On the contrary, we may be heading for another round of violent ethnic conflict, involving more organized and better armed Rwandese, Congolese, and even Burundi armed groups. The dimensions, magnitude, and implications of this round of ethnic violence may not be easy to predict and manage. In particular given the volatile situation of Burundi, this crisis could shed blood within and across several borders. This is why Rwanda should not drug her feet in supporting the peace initiatives in Burundi and the implementation of the Lusaka ceasefire agreement as the only viable and sustainable solutions to the region. Mineral and Arms Trafficking for how long are you going to continue to facilitate the bursting of UN sanctions on Anitas? For how long is Kanom International Airport going to continue to service as a link in the delivery of these minerals and in their exchange for the supply of arms, ammos, and other military supplies? The fact that these aircrafts land, offload, load and take off at night does not mean we do not know. What is your personal or maybe Rwanda's cut in cash or in military hardware for facilitating these transactions? I would wish to take the liberty to inform you that more and more Rwandese have started doubting your honest among other things over the war in the DRC, we believe that finally, the war has less to do with our security concerns and more to do with individuals making money, that it has finally become a high-value export commodity for you and those around you. Crisis within the RPA Rwanda's treasury is certainly not able to finance your operations in Rwanda and in the DRC. The Ministry of Defense is not even capable of financing 30% of the recurrent needs. Salaries of soldiers in the DRC are not paid out until when they come home one by one. You know that billions of Rwandese francs have been borrowed from these unpaid salaries and have been diverted for other purposes. What will happen when all these soldiers demand for their salaries are to go or when they may have to return from the DRC all of a sudden? I know some of these funds are the ones used to feed about 20,000 irregular soldiers, local defense forces, former rebels, and ex-FAR who are not on the official payroll, but who are now fighting along the RPA, both at home and in the DRC. The ministry has acute transport and accommodation problems and allocations have been marred with nepotism. The whole of last year for example the RPA never made any purchase of any military equipment. 
No uniforms were purchased. There are less than 10 operational troop carriers in the entire army. There are no food reserves. There are no medical reserves. Whatever is purchased has at least a 70% contribution from the famous invisible hand, revenues from the December. Are you aware of the suffering of your soldiers at home and in the DRC? Soldiers RCA is often diverted to higher planes to deliver food supplies to troops in the DRC, do you know that soldiers often go hungry or feed so poorly that malnutrition is rampant? How many hospitals are you going to take over as to accommodate your casualties from the DRC? Recent fighting in the Tanganyika sector resulted into about 3,000 casualties, how many dead do you think this kind of fighting is sustainable? Why do you allow these casualties drugs to be so congest, why do they lack facilities and drugs to the extent that the sick have to purchase their own food and medicine? Do you know the brutality of some of your most royal officers, like for example in the Republican Guard and the Directorate Military Intelligence, where mistreatment and torture of soldiers often results into desertion and even suicide? Are aware of the volume of requests for demobilization by a cross-section of officers and men including some of your senior officers who are totally disgusted by the current state of affairs? Saying no to applicants is certainly not the solution. How do you intend to go about financing the demobilization of the listed 10,000 officers and men? And this is just the beginning. Military justice is a sham. It is public knowledge that you and you alone appoint and direct both the military prosecutors and the judges on who to handle specific cases. You give instructions on those to be released, those to be imprisoned and for how long as well as those to be discharged from the armed forces or those to be hanged. How many military and civilian detention centers are you going to open up? Who gives you the right to detain in UN human conditions so many officers and men for so long and trial and some of them without even charges? How do you intend to go about mending the cracks which have developed in your army over problems of ethnicity, welfare, failure to pay salaries, Anglophone versus Francophone biases, nepotism, conduct of the war in the DRC, property relations, and more recently political outlook vis avis the way forward for Rwanda? Particularly interesting is the growing lift at the middle and higher levels of command, between the officers personally and other officers, who have risen through the ranks out of their own competence and who therefore tend to look at situations more objectively. Why do you promote and demote, discharge often with disgrace, force into premature retirement, or unjustifiable demobilization of your officers and men at will, as if the Rwandese armed forces are your personal estate? RPF, RPA Sustainability while the above-mentioned contradictions within the RPA seriously undermine its operational efficiency, some of these factors, and others, combine to greatly undermine the sustainability of narrow recruitment base, since your preferred source of recruitment is the RPF Stutzi, discriminatory tendencies and practices in the RPA leadership, especially as pertaining to appointments, promotions and facilitation, limited human and financial resource capacity vis avis your militarism in handling national and regional security issues. Anti-people ideology characterized by intimidation, coercion, elimination of political opponents and killing of unarmed populations. Continuous failure to preserve own forces associated with military adventurism and gross welfare deficiencies resulting into high death and casualty rates. Partisanship of the army, the RPA often kinds itself pitted against political parties and sections of population not towing the RPF-RPA line. Coup d'état against Pasteur Bizimungu the RPF declaration, which is part of the constitution among other things changed the composition of members of parliament, see Arusha peace agreement, in such a way that the RPF RPA directly influences who goes and stays in parliament and finally who is appointed an executive post and who serves in the judiciary. Your leadership has often abused these provisions, so as to destabilize and manipulate all the institutions of government to own advantage. You and those to you have for a long time silently wished to have a Tutsi RPF chairman and eventually a Tutsi president of the republic. The only candidate for these two offices was none other than you. The first step in this direction was achieved in 1997, when in typically RPF RPA manipulated so-called elections, Colonel Alex Kanya Rengwe resigned the RPF top post for you and His Excellency President Pastor Bizimangu settled for the post of vice chairman. 
At this stage allow me to take the liberty to inform you and the world that HF President Pastor Bizimangu is a person who commands the respect of Rwandis of all walks of life. Most of us see him as a man with vision and capacity to conceive and implement programs, which would go a long way in alleviating the challenges facing the Rwandese people today and tomorrow. In any case it was with his guidance that Rwanda managed to move from the state of chaos of early 1994 to the relatively stable situation of today, RPF international contradictions notwithstanding. By the year 1999, you felt it was time to overhaul all the institutions of governance, so as to make them compliant with your long-term agenda, to peacefully take over the presidency and finally pave the way for your sole presidential candidature, come the elections in the year 2003. Incidentally not many people believe you will even allow these elections to take place. You treacherously created the Forum for Political Parties, a club of sycophants of the RPF, RPA and allied political parties, which is one thing that has no vocation in the laws of Rwanda. It is appalling that it bears the unconstitutional, arbitrary and outrageous powers to subjugate independence of the parliament, an institution that is vested with the legitimate authority and power to exercise checks on the executive government. The first institution to be tackled was the judiciary. However, while it is during this period that it was reshuffled and without any problems, it had indeed always been submissive to the extent that it could not turn down anything sponsored by RPF RPA leadership. It is in this sense that the judiciary could not reverse the election of Major General Paul Kogome as president and instead went ahead to swear him into office contrary to the Arusha Peace Agreement. The former Speaker of Parliament Honorable Joseph Severenzi Kabui, had previously opposed the intervention of the Forum for Political Parties into National Assembly Affairs. The RPF RPA in the person of Dr. Charles Muligand engaged the former speaker over the radio and television under the cover of the chairman of the Forum for Political Parties. Insults were thrown at the speaker irrespective of his status as head of the Transitional National Assembly and finally, the speaker was battered into submission. Thereafter, the parliament was swept according to instructions from your RPF RPA. All independent-minded M.PS irrespective of party affiliation were removed by the RPF RPA manipulated forum for political parties. This was so that subsequent activities would not be blocked by the parliament. The current speaker of parliament is indeed a man who takes instructions from you rather religiously. Did you know that like several other top leaders in your government, he is also busy looking for a home for his family members abroad? Removal of senior cabinet minister via the parliamentary censure however became difficult as His Excellency President Bizimangu intervened in his defense of some of his competent cabinet ministers. Next was removal of the parliamentary speaker, Joseph Seberenzi, a man with a clean record who had aspired to become chairman of the Liberal Party and who given his mass mobilizing activities and themes, was suspected of having presidential ambitions. This would have made him the only Tutsi rival to you. As mentioned earlier, he had also conflicted with the infallible RPF RPA leadership over parliamentary reshuffles and so was no longer in any good book anyway. The case of Prime Minister Celestin Rijima is reported as one of a genuine attempt to censure a member of executive by parliament. According to Arusha Peace Agreement, Constitution, the Speaker is the successor to the President in case the latter is unable to complete his term of office. This, maybe, was the strongest reason for the Speaker of Parliament to have gone out office before your coup d'etat. Your team very well knew he was not going to see the Constitution violated and find himself lined without putting up a fight. The last obstacle to be removed was President Pastor Bizimangu who indeed remains the presidential popular choice of most Rwandese. Parliament was instructed by the RPF RPA to use all types of fabricated reasons to pass a vote of no confidence in the president. But many Rwandese knew that you had wished to get rid of the president for many months and finally when it happened, some of us were not so surprised. We were more surprised by the lies and the viciousness of your apostles. However, even after you completed the coup d'etat against the president, you remained with a constitutional obstacle for you to be able to take over the presidency without appearing to have violated the constitution. While it is this true that the RPF declaration prevails in the hierarchy of laws of Rwanda, this is only correct when two parts of the constitution are in conflict. In this case however there was no conflict. The RPF declaration established the post of vice presidency but is silent on its powers and responsibilities as well as on possibilities and modalities of succession to the presidency. 
On the other hand, a Russia peace agreement is clear about the replacement of the president and provides for the Speaker of National Assembly as the successor. What is appalling however is that the international community, political parties in the country, the media, and the civil society groups all remained silent when the intimidated Constitutional Court declared Major General Paul Kogome the rightful successor to His Excellency President Pastor Bizimangu. Thanks to all the manipulations, you now appear set as the incumbent president to finally push your way through the coming election as the sole presidential candidate come the year 2003. However, it should be clear to clear to all that what the RPF RPA you lead has actually done is to a carry gradual and peaceful coup d'etat against His Excellency President Pastor Bizimangu and to violate the constitution. Sham elections. Your Excellency, you are making Rwandese and the international community to believe that you have finally opened the way for democratization. But you and me very well know this is yet in an other wild goose chase for our people. You and your team have planned, and you are executing sham elections aimed at bringing to office members of the RPF a clique around you, and come the year 2003, the sham elections must give you, and come the year 2003, the sham elections must give you an election landslide presidential mandate. The sham electoral commission has not as yet come up with guidelines on the elections to come. Neither has the parliament passed any electoral laws and yet your government has gone ahead to fabricate electoral procedures and constituencies deliberately demarcated to favor the RPF RPA supported candidates. You have barred all political forces in the country from campaigning and yet your RPF RPA has launched a clandestine national campaign program that is now several months old. Candidates in all communes have been identified, campaign resources are being supplied and rival candidates are being intimidated. The RPF RPA is busy intimidating and or bringing candidates so as to make them join the RPF RPA camp or to simply keep away. This applies to most communal leaders who are members of other political parties. The RPA has been brought in to give full support to the RPF RPA candidates countrywide. The RPA Army HQS, Brigade and Battalion Commanders as well as Intelligence Officers have all been briefed and facilitated to ensure RPF RPA victory at any cost. Dictatorial Leadership Style You will no doubt the existing power vacuum in the RPF RPA to gradually and unfairly strengthen your position by distancing those you were not sure of and dividing others by creating artificial conflicts. In the process you developed your own personal style of leadership, a dictatorial type of leadership, in many ways akin to the rule of Rwanda's pre-colonial despotic kings. You surround yourself with and only trust your childhood friends, former classmates those who have ever served under you or in any case those who have served under you, or in any case those willing to bring in you information about others however biased the information may be. You coerce, intimidate and even physically assault those who work with you. Extreme out of anger, sometimes even on national radio and television are common occurrences in your day-to-day -day running of state affairs. In military circles such moods are sometimes accompanied by physical assault of those close to you. Indeed, senior army officers, military assistants and escort have often become victims of your moods by for example being slapped, punched, whipped or at least insulted and threatened in the process of executing their duties or even in meetings. You remember one senior officer recently escaped to Brussels after such treatment in an army council meeting. You believe you know and understand everything much better than all other people and consequently you assume you do not be advised by anybody. You do not entertain debate and those around you do not dare venture into raising controversial matters. Your word irreversible. You kill and save at will. You entertain meetings only to monitor tendencies and people's inclinations, with a view to assessing how to enforce your positions. You take all the important decisions in the RPF, RPA government. Anybody else's initiative, which indeed is a very rare occurrence, must carefully be sold to you to have it approved. The entire Rwandese community is aware of this kind of leadership style and this is why none dares cross your way even in words. Those close to you what they know for sure you would like to hear. Those in your company only dare laugh when it is your pleasure and who they raised provocative questions. This being the case, there is no simple program, policy or major activity that has been carried out in the RPF, RPA and in the respective governments of national reconciliation without either your personal initiative or direct approval. 
I therefore give you credit for good that the RPF RPA has achieved and hold you responsible for its omissions and wrong actions. What went wrong? While there is not doubt that the RPF RPA struggle in Rwanda and in the war in DRC were justified, and despite apparent military victories, there is overwhelming evidence to the effect that in the conduct of the armed struggle against the juvenile Habiri Mana regime, and the war to stop genocide, the management of state affairs in Kigali, the conduct of the ongoing war in the DRC, there has been continuous failure to evolve a correct political line, a correct organizational line, and a correct military line. Over the years the RPA has militarily been guided by trial and error and as situations change there is no serious efficient to adopt a military line that is in harmony with situation, that ensures the harmony between our aims and available resources, that avoids militarism and adventurism. In particular, our experiences in late 1990, 1991, and early 1992, are clear illustrations of this point. The RPF-RPA wars in the DRC have continued to follow the same pattern, thereby proving that the RPF-RPA has not up to date not appreciated the necessity to adopt scientific and tested approaches to war. As a consequence, the RPF-RPA has always paid dearly in human life. You of course let nobody know your death and casualty rates. But these rates, we know anyway and maybe you should endeavor to know, the amount of bitterness among your senior officers whenever there is talk about those who perished and those who survived. You will remember that despite the RPF, RPA political program, which is progressive and patriotic, which supports the right and condemns the wrong, which aspires to work with and for the masses, the RPF, RPA leadership had by the end of 1990, totally given up the necessity to follow a broad, patriotic, nationalistic, progressive and anti-sectarian political line. The weakest link in this connection is the sectarian character of the RPF RPA leadership, which is based on the assumption that all Tutsi must be allies, all Hutus must not be trusted and other nationalities in the region are politically and militarily inferior. In the DRC for example, we develop the naive belief that all Congolese are politically useless and born cowards. We have consequently refused to empower the Congolese people so as to transform them into self-sustaining political and military fighters. We naively think we can substitute them in their own liberation struggle. Or maybe as some quarters have always suggested, the RPF RPA has a hidden agenda for the DRC. The RPF RPA organizational line, the ability to maintain the equilibrium between various military, political, economic and other forces and factors, whether at home or in the DRC, whether in the military, in government or elsewhere has and remains most haphazard. The internal and interinstitutional contradictions and problems highlighted earlier serve as clear illustrations of the RPF RPA failure to evolve a correct organizational line over the years. The instability characteristic of the RPF RPA organizational plane. Lack of political education and political work. It is unbelievable that with the RPF political program by the side, and with flesh NRM NRA experience, the presence of intellectuals among its ranks, notwithstanding that the RPA leadership could have failed to appreciate the necessity to adopt a correct military line, a correct organizational line as the sine qua non for waging a successful liberation struggle. However, to the RPA insiders, this was and is no surprise. The culture of study whether of political matters, military strategy and tactics, organizational problems and opportunities was never given a platform. In particular political education was slowly stifled and political work in the armed forces was reduced to welfare issues, while political work among the population was the exception rather the general rule. This is how you destroyed political education and marginalized political work in the RPF RPA is dead. On the contrary, people joke about your intelligence service to affect that you will soon have an operative for every citizen. The fact that you personally believe in mechanical discipline rather than conscious discipline was no justification for you to marginalize political education and political education and political work both in the armed forces and among the population. Indeed the RPF RPA survives, thanks to much weakens enemies. Observations Whatever has been described above has evidence. If you or anybody else in your regime wishes to challenge any one of these facts, it shall be ready to provide names, numbers, dates and places. All of us who were in the RPF RPA know the above as facts. Some NGOs and UN agencies witnessed and some of these atrocities. 
Even the RPF, RPA Hutu members could not be shielded from these realities irrespective of how much those concerned tried to hide evidence. 5. In any case there are survivors of these killings who could give evidence if they were given security guarantees. Here above mentioned tendencies and practices were at some stage or another raised and discussed in appropriate fora. Those who raised the issues were considered as negative elements and treated as enemies. It is regrettable that paving the way to the presidency should have necessitated the destabilization of institutions of governance and the use of all types of dirty tricks even within the RPF RPA. In popular it is a shame that attempts should have been made by RPF RPA elements to unfairly tarnish the image of His Excellency President Pastor Busy Maungu. To the Rwandese, what matters is not whether the next president is Tutsi or a Hutu, or whether he, she shall be from this party or that other party, but rather whether the next president shall have an appropriate program and the capacity to champion the implementation of such a program. You have turned the RPF, RPA into monolithic institutions serving individual elements at the detriment of the people of Rwanda and neighbors. The RPF, RPA has narrowed down rather than burdened out. It has finally turned out to be an RPF, RPA clique rather than a mass organization. It has ended up top-heavy rather true grassroots based. The RPF, RPA should not only apologize to the people of Uganda and the DRC for having made the initial military attack on the Uganda People's Defense Forces in Kisangani, but individuals responsible should be tried for crimes against humanity. The RPF, RPA leadership should be investigated for having illegally appropriated DRC's wealth. The same leadership must declare and account for whatever funds that have been siphoned out of the DRC. The RPF, RPA leaders must account to families for all RPA soldiers who have died and got buried in the DRC since the RPA entered Congo. The remains of these late comrades should be brought back home and given appropriate burial. Rwandese soldiers cannot continue to be sacrificed in the DRC so as to enrich individuals in the RPF, RPA leadership. Rwanda must support fully the Lazaka ceasefire agreement, so that our soldiers can come back home and ensure our national defense and territorial integrity from within our borders. The RPF, RPA did not overcome the genocide forces and gallantly taken over state power as always been claimed, rather the RPF, RPA in the process, become overwhelmed by the situation, the genocide, state power, and abandoned properties to the extent of having made fundamental errors even at that very early stage of the struggle. To date, the RPF, RPA leadership has not even appreciated such errors. The RPA has not defeated the Exfar and Interhaham militias as is often claimed, because these forces have only been pushed away and the fighting continues close to our border and may in fact as pointed out earlier, spill over into Rwanda if regional security issues continue to be mishandled. Your government is politically bankrupt, it has no direction and its leadership has totally betrayed the people of Rwanda by failing to implement the RPF, RPA political program and the programs of the respective governments of national reconciliation. Conclusion You and your government must make immediate arrangements to hand over state power to popularly elected government. The struggle continue. Major Alphonse Furuma Major Alphonse Furuma, Biography http de point double slash douze neuf point dix neuf quatre point de cinq deux point huit zero slash quatre fil slash deux seize trois point pdf names alphonse for uma major nineteen fifty three born in commune kinyumi by amba prefecture republic of rwanda nineteen sixty two to nineteen sixty nine primary education juru primary school nakivaral and ankol uganda 1969 to 1972, secondary education. Kitabi Seminary, Bushini, Uganda. Higher education. St. Peter's College Toro, Uganda. 1975 to 1978, university education, BA Econs and Rural Econ, Makua University. Kampala, Uganda. 1979 to 1983, economic teacher, examiner. Kenya National Examination Council. Member of Rwandese Alliance for National Unity, Kenya. Commissioner. Postgraduate Education. Kenyatta University, Nairobi, Kenya. 1983-1987, Instituta, NRA School of Political. 
Education. 1987 to 1987, founder member, RPF School of Political Education, Uganda. 1987 to 1998, Commandant, NRA 5th Division School of Political Education. Lira, Uganda. 1989 to 1990, Division Political Commissar, NRA 4th Division. 1990 October, Officers Basic Course. Bombo Uganda. RPF the RPA, in struggle. Political Commissar and Administrator. RPF, Commissioner for Inspectorate. HTTP 2.2/12.19.4.252.8.0/4fil/2.16.3.pdf. From the time Arusha Peace Agreement was being negotiated up to as late as 1996, you carried out a deliberate policy of using all means possible to reduce the Hutu population in the Umutara, Kibungo, and Bugesera regions. These areas were deliberately resettled by old caseload returnees from Uganda, Tanzania, and Burundi, respectively. Families of many top RPF RPA leaders are among those who were resettled in this manner. Certainly, all Rwandese deserve to be settled, but your government could have carried out these resettlements without violating the spirit of the Arusha Peace Agreement and without having to terrorize, displace or kill fellow Rwandese. Having signed the Arusha Peace Agreement, the RPF RPA, supposedly to maintain the Hutu Tutsi power sharing equation, found it convenient to liquidate the only few Hutu fighters who had been previously recruited from the demilitarized zone. You remember, these criminal operations were code-named Fania. Some of those who survived could give evidence if given certain guarantees. When the RPF RPA launched the offensive to stop genocide, every Hutu was assumed to be a killer. For moths and from one border to another, Hutus were chased and massacred on sight. Where it was not possible to kill, there was no opportunity lost to arrest, torture and detain a Hutu at the slightest provocation. There was thus every raison for every reason for even the moderate Hutus to find it safer to flee the country with the killers. Indeed, some of the bodies, which continued to float in the Akajara River towards the end and shortly after the genocide, included those of Hutus massacred by some RPF RPA elements. Major Alphonse Furuma, open letter to His Excellency Paul Kogome, also RPF Chairman, and Chairman RPA Command, Kigali, Rwanda, the 23rd of January, 2001.